Welcome, Ben Runner. In the last few months, you've seen me look at five failed consoles that never made it out of Japan, Europe, and America. And with that last entry, you no doubt thought I was done. But I have one more trick left up my sleeve, as you can see right here. During my research for several other videos I produced, I discovered the vibrant video game markets of both Korea and Taiwan, and I was keen to open up some more of this knowledge. That got me looking at the whole continent of Asia, Japan excluded, to fit this very format. So because of this crossover, you might well see a couple of consoles you've encountered before, but I bet that there's at least one on this list that you've never heard of. I think as far as the four videos that I've done on this subject are concerned, this one delves the most into the obscure, something you always say you want to see more of on my channel, and I don't like to disappoint. Now I'm pretty sure that this will be the last video on this subject, although I may return to Japan at some point, as there are more consoles I could cover from there, and I'm sure this will make many of you sad given how popular they've been, but I do have a new idea for a spin-off of sorts, but I don't want to ruin that for you, so stay tuned. But for now, let's take a trip down the dark path of disaster once more, as we look at five failed consoles that never made it out of Asia. <laughs> First up we have a console that I've featured on the channel before, in fact I made an entire video about it some years ago now, so if you want to know more about this fascinating system then click the link in the description, but I'll still give you a basic overview here of course. Back in the 1980s, Daewoo were one of the biggest companies in Korea and still are in fact, producing a wide range of different products from TVs to cars. In fact, it was the latter of those that we probably know them best for in the West. Their electronics division was one of the very first to sign up to manufacture MSX computers, and soon found the venture to be a very successful one. However, the Korean video game market at this time was absolutely flooded by illegal Famiclones. In fact, the problem with bootleg consoles had become so bad but on July the 1st, 1987, the Korean government passed a law that protected the copyright of software programs in that region, meaning all those bootleg games and Famiclones dominating the market instantly became illegal. They even burned many of these in the streets of Korea just to make a point. And Daewoo, being the smart company that they were, came prepared for this new ruling, as they had designed a new Korean console of their own to occupy that space. They took the existing MSX standard and dramatically reduced the hardware by removing things like the keyboard and expansion ports. As most MSX games came on cartridge anyway, it was ideal for console use, and there wouldn't be any real problems with compatibility either because of this. The Zemix actually turned out to be pretty successful for Daewoo, and they even saw a glut of new software companies spring up to create new games for it. Several revisions of the hardware followed that not only made adjustments to the already attractive design, but also kept up to date with changes and improvements to the MSX standard. This does of course mean that its inclusion on the list of failed consoles is perhaps a little unfair, and admittedly Daewoo never intended to launch the Zemix elsewhere. It was created to specifically serve the Korean market, but it would have been even more unfair to create a video about Asian specific consoles and leave out the Zemix. This next entry is easily the most obscure on this list, and actually represents a series of different consoles rather than one specific model. In 1976, a Korean company called Olympus Electronics jumped on the Pong bandwagon by producing a simple plug and play version of the game for the home, just like the ones we'd already seen across the western world. This first console, called the Otron TV Sports 7600, 
or the Gamematic 7600 had four variations of the Atari Classic as well as hardwired detachable controllers for two players. This sold fairly well, so a year later the company came back with a revised model in the form of the Optron TV Sports 7800, which upped the game selection to six and also included a light gun. This also sold quite well in their homeland, so Olympus announced plans to release a third version of the TV Sports console that would support interchangeable ROM cartridges. This was set to hit the market in 1981, but nobody seems to be sure what happened to it. There are reports that the console entered production, but there are also other reports in the same time that show Olympus Electronics was suffering serious financial problems, and it's likely that the company was shut down before the console ever made it out to retail. Next up we have a console that I've talked about in several other videos on my channel in the past, so it's probably the most familiar one on this list to my regular viewers, and that console is Bit Corporation's rather questionable Dina 2-in-1. In 1986, Taiwanese company Bitcorp, who at the time were best known for their range of bootleg Atari 2600 games, created a console of their own called the Dina 2-in-1. I say their own, but the Dina was actually an illegal clone of the ColecoVision that was also able to play games from the hardware similar Sega SG-1002, hence the 2-in-1 part of its name. Due to both consoles being based on very similar technology, which would go on to be known as the MSX standard, Bitcorp were able to include two cartridge slots and a BIOS that would change over depending on what slot was being used. The release of this console also prompted the company to start producing Coleco compatible games too, that were eventually rebranded and released in the West by well known mail order specialist Telegames. And this leads us directly onto a very large caveat regarding the Dina's inclusion on this list, because the console did actually make it out of Asia, albeit in a rather strange fashion, which you could argue still makes it eligible. You see, by 1988, Telegames were the official distributor for the ColecoVision and its games in Europe and North America, having bought all the stock from both Coleco and their European partners, CBS Electronics, when they decided to exit the market after the impact of the great North American video game crash. But they had a problem, they had long since run out of consoles, but still had plenty of cartridges in their inventory to shift. Step forward Bit Corporation who offered Telegames all their existing stock of Dina 2-in-1 consoles. It still had a whole warehouse full of these after the Dina failed to compete with all the family clones that had flooded the Taiwanese market. From there, Telegames acquired the rights from Coleco to officially distribute the Dina 2-in-1 as the Telegames Personal Arcade, promoting it as a ColecoVision compatible console, without any mention of the additional SG-1000 compatibility. All Telegames did was create a new outer box for the console, although this was nothing more than a lazy rehash of the existing box. They didn't even remove the Bitcorp and Dina branding from the console itself. These consoles were only ever sold through the Telegames mail order centres in Lancaster, Texas, USA and Wigston, Leicester, UK. According to Telegames owner and founder Pete Mortimer, who still runs the company to this day, the consoles were mostly bought by existing ColecoVision owners, whose original consoles had stopped working. Both the Dina 2-in-1 and Telegames Personal Arcade are now very rare and sought after by collectors. I did consider ending the video with this one, because when it comes to Asian consoles, this is probably the most interesting example of all. The main reason for that is because out of all the consoles featured in this video, the Taiwanese Funtech Super Acan is the only one that was developed completely from scratch and not based on any form of existing hardware. The announcement of the console itself was a big surprise when it came back in 1995, as the manufacturers Funtech had no experience in the video game industry whatsoever. They had made their name in several related areas, educational aids, office supplies and database software. Apparently their parent company, Dung Huang Technology, had seen the huge success of the Sega and Nintendo consoles in the country and thought they could grab a slice of the pie by creating a homegrown system that would appeal more to the extremely patriotic Taiwanese people. 
By the time the Super 8 can made it out the door, it had already been delayed numerous times and had been through a very troubled development cycle. Funtech simply weren't equipped to develop something that would rival Sega and Nintendo, and this is best shown by the console's specs, which were at least a generation behind. It had the same Motorola, 68,000 CPU as we had seen in the Sega Mega Drive and a graphics chip with incredible similarities to the one found in the SNES. It looks very much like they tried to take the best bits for each console and combine them. Now this would have been great, had we seen it three or four years earlier. But you have to remember that this was 1995, and the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation were now the two big contenders. The Super ACAM was also cartridge based, when nearly everyone was moving over to CD, although a CD-ROM add-on was announced, but ultimately went unreleased. Possibly the biggest mistake Funtech made though was the price. Hoping to claw back some of the ever spiralling development costs, they priced the console at around twice the price of its 16-bit rivals. In fact, it sold so badly that it was discontinued within a year and the remaining consoles were sold off for scrap. Only 12 games were released in this period with no big name titles amongst them, and a further 11 were announced but went unreleased. The Super ACAN failed so badly that it lost Funtech over 6 million US dollars and forced the company into bankruptcy. I just had to include this console here, and it was only right to save it until last, because I've been somewhat obsessed with it ever since I saw the ever entertaining Ashens review one on his channel some years ago. It's hard to believe that such an absurdly named console even exists. Here it is in all its glory. As you may have guessed, the Kensing Ton Nintendo V is a Chinese attempt to recreate the brilliance of the Nintendo Wii. Released in 2007, less than a year after the Wii, the V closely resembles Nintendo's design, and also came bundled with motion controllers, albeit very poor ones. It was available in three colours, Arctic White, Hot Pink and Mint Blue, and had 12 built-in games, including classics such as Fry Egg, Come On and Free Craps. Further games were available on Game Boy Advance like cartridges as opposed to CDs like the Wii. And it seems that four of these were made available, containing anywhere between two and six games. Most of which were rip-offs of popular games from other systems like Bejeweled, Tetris and Arkanoid. Ken Sing Ton reported that they had sold over 300,000 units of the V in China alone. These strong sales prompted Kensing Ton to release the console in Japan 2 in 2008 as a slightly redesigned and rebranded Sport V. Then shortly after, the completely redesigned V2 was launched in China, which had changed it from a vertically aligned console to a horizontal one that many people say resembles the PlayStation 3. But I actually think it looks more like a Fairchild Channel F. These are a lot rarer and far harder to come by online. What's interesting about this model is that apparently it has support for North American NTSC and European PAL TVs, suggesting that this console was planned for release worldwide. This is no doubt the reasoning behind the radical redesign and changing branding too, thus avoiding potential lawsuits from Nintendo. The actual tech specs for the V are unclear, but we do know that it was based around a 16-bit Chinese-produced Sun Plus SPG CPU. Rather ironically, the V itself was also cloned too some years later by a company called Jungle Tack, who produced several different consoles including the Zone 60 and Wireless 60 that included many of the same built-in games as well as the new ones and even worse controllers that use simple switches to detect motion. Wii 
，完全不受天气、空间、时间的限制。力威力棒的真实运动感，让新加坡国家奥林匹克运动员委员会副主席 James 也爱不释手。从小培养孩子运动的习惯，是父母送给孩子最好的礼物。力威力棒，让孩子在家就能锻炼强壮体魄，让你不用再花费大笔费用，让孩子学运动，节省你大量时间和收藏空间。多达十二种的国际运动娱乐游戏浓缩在这台小小的力威力棒里，拟真画面，零时差互动效果，实时音效，真实震动手感。让你体验真实的临场感，太有趣了，真的很好玩哎！我喜欢钓鱼，像真的一样，好累哦，跟运动没两样。只要拿起威力棒，对着你家电视机，就能打球、钓鱼、射飞镖，从事多达十二种的运动项目。纯中文使用界面，孩子、老人家都会使用。四十五分钟提醒装置，保护孩子视力，预防运动过度。三种颜色任你挑选。随机附赠十二种运动游戏、手柄、贴纸及运动介绍手册。耶！是金牌保证的。你有多久没陪伴孩子？你知道父母在家有多寂寞吗？力威力棒让你向家人表达出你关爱家庭的心，搭起亲子间互动的桥梁，让孤独在家的父母重新找到快乐源泉，让全家人欢乐开心。只要拿起威力棒，对着你家电视机就能打球、钓鱼、射飞镖，从事多达十二种的运动项目。纯中文使用界面，孩子、老人家都会使用。四十五分钟提醒装置，保护孩子视力，预防运动过度。贴心的手柄防滑设计，离威力棒让全家人都喜欢。只要拿起威力棒，对着你家电视机就能打球、钓鱼、射飞镖，从事多达十二种的运动项目。小孩、老人家都能找到自己最爱的运动。新加坡国家奥林匹克运动员委员会副主席 James 全家都是不易的爱用者。拟真画面，实时音效，真实震动手感，零时差互动效果，让你体验真实的临场感。力威力棒是全家人的欢乐源泉。力威力棒的上市在网站上已引起热烈的回响。想更多了解力威力棒吗？可至以下网址查询。And that completes my deep dive into five failed consoles that never made it out of Asia. Are there any others you can think of that should have made the list? Or are you lucky enough to own one of these obscure oddities and want to tell us more about it? As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts and views in the comments, so please get typing. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons and YouTube members for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, D Vaughan, Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Sethe Robinson, Carl Olson, Dos Gamerman, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, Andrew McKay, Retro Resolution, Matt Standish, James Taylor, Ozzy B, 8-Bit Guy, and Electric Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the lad, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.